for us, isn't it? Yeah. Praise the Lord. I mean, fall is in the air. I'm telling you, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. It's just about hunting season. Is that all you care about, right? No. Listen, uh, it's a great day for us. It's a greater day for one of our brothers, Dick Heilman, who went home to be with the Lord on Friday. He is in glory, uh, celebrating his first Sunday there. Uh, but uh, we are left in the land of the dying. Uh, but it's a wonderful thing, even here, with the Lord on your side. So uh, I do want to just uh, ask you to pray for the family. The services will be Wednesday at the Katagnus Funeral Home in Pottstown, over there by the high school. I can't think of the name of the street right now. I think the uh, viewing part is from 10.30, 11.30, and the service is 11.30 a.m. That's Wednesday at Katagnus uh, Funeral Home. Don't forget the services this evening. We have the meal at 5.30. If you haven't been out, come and join us. There's a uh, good food and great fellowship, and then 6:30 uh, we have. Uh, I think that you know this. Uh, we have a lot of the small groups, the uh, marriage uh, class that's going on upstairs, and then the traditional service in there. Uh, if you're interested in what's happening, I think what's happening in Syria and uh, the Russians getting involved uh, could have could have some very profound prophetic uh, significance. So come out. We'll talk about that this evening. I'll be talking about that in the evening service. And then finally, right after the service today, uh, there's going to be a, a prayer meeting at 116, just brief, a prayer time uh, for uh, Lily Beth Rothenberger gets her scan results and everything it takes a step forward this week. So they're going to have some prayer time on our teenagers who has been battling some, uh, uh, you know, rather uh, difficult uh, physical things. So if you want to join us for that, uh, you come over to room uh, 116 right after the service. And this morning we have this special treat I've been telling you all along. Uh, Tom and uh, uh, Sharon Huckle. And Sharon was that beautiful woman with a beautiful voice who sang so wonderfully uh, during the offertory. Uh, and Tom, they have been part of this ministry from the very start. Uh, they are with the Evangelization Society of Philadelphia, or Hannah Neal House, many people call it. But it is a ministry uh, to the Jewish community, the folks on the Jewish community in Philadelphia. They have been ministering there for years, and I'm sure that uh, Tom may touch on some of that, I don't know, but he has this really special message this morning that is entitled, entitled Messiah, or Jesus, in, in, the day of Atone, in the Day of Atonement. It's a great Old Testament message, and all those Old Testament pictures and types of Jesus that are there for us to learn from. So I'm going to ask Tom to come out and turn it over to him as he ministers uh, the Word of God to us. Oh. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. No, you're not looking at the Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> the green light is on, Adam. I'm not getting you. You're not getting me? Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, this morning, we're going to share a, a message called Messiah in the Day of Atonement. But in my past visits here, I always shared with you how the Jewish people say hello is still the same way in the land of Israel that Jesus said to the disciples when he appeared to him in the upper room following the resurrection. Now, in your English Bible, those words are peace unto you, but you realize in Israel they don't speak uh, English, at least at the time of Christ they didn't. I know that. And so they say it in Hebrew. And the way you say hello is shalom alechem, peace unto you. If someone gives you that greeting, it's only cordial to say hello back. And the way you do that is you reverse it and say it backwards. Unto you be peace, or Alechem Shalom. All right, let's try it. I'll say it forward, and you return the, the greeting. Shalom Alechem. A tad too Gentile. In order to say Alechem properly, I always tell people, pretend you have a bagel stuck in your throat, and you're trying to clear it, because the accent is on the K in Alech. All right, let's try it again. Shalom Alechem. That was a much heartier handshake. Well, my wife and I have been with the Hananiel Ministry since, actually, pastor, since 1991. Before that, we were with Chosen People Ministries. Uh, the mission has been there for 101 years. I haven't been there quite that long. Just, just you probably didn't figure that out. That's all right. And part of our ministry, especially since the 90s, has been working with the Russian-speaking Jewish people who've migrated to the United States. They've been very open to the gospel. The Jewish festivals are a big part of their, our ministry. Whenever they occur, we try and point to how they picture Jesus. 
For example, the four feasts that they celebrate in the spring, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Pentecost are all a picture of Christ's ministry at his first coming. And then there's that interval of time, a long, hot, dry summer in Israel, and so it is an interval of time between the Advents. And the three festivals they celebrate in the fall, the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, and Tabernacles, are a picture of Christ in the second coming. About 12 days ago, we had an outreach for uh, Rosh Hashanah. Oh, that's right, I'm from Philadelphia. I didn't say it right. Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish festival for the beginning of the year, and they go out and they sound a trumpet. They sound a shofar. It's the Jewish New Year. Well, guess what? After an interval of time, Someday in the future, the Lord's coming back. I don't know if you heard that or not, but when he does, he's going to come with a great sound of what? A trumpet. And so the Rosh Hashanah is a picture of the rapture of the church. And then after that, we celebrated Yom Kippur just on Friday night with our, our Jewish people. There was about 40 to 50 people. They heard the message of the gospel. I know a lot, a lot of seed was planted. No one made a profession of faith, but I will tell you this, last year on Yom Kippur, five Jewish people came to know the Lord as their Savior. So the information I'm sharing for you is very important for the, for the lost to hear, but it's also applicable for us as a believer. And the more you become familiar with it, uh, the Jewish festivals, the more you're able to share the gospel with them as well. If you will, open your scriptures to the book of Leviticus chapter 23. And the verses that we heard read earlier, beginning in verse 26, and if you have the ability to do so, if you have a little bookmarker, you might want to also put something in Leviticus chapter 16, because we'll be going back and forth between them. Leviticus 23 and Leviticus 16. But Leviticus 23 and verse 26, it says, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month, there will be a, in Hebrew, a Yom Kippur. Now that's the Hebrew way of saying it. Of course, if you're from Philadelphia and you live anywhere on the East Coast all the way up to Brooklyn, they seem to celebrate a different festival. It's called Yom Kippur. <laughs> Yom Kippur is the day of atonement or day of covering. It shall be unto you a holy convocation unto you. You will afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. You shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement before the, the, uh, you, the Lord your God. Whatsoever soul it will be that will not be afflicted in that same day, he'll be cut off from among his people. Whatsoever soul it be that does any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. You'll do no manner of work. It'll be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest. And you will afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month. From even to even, you will celebrate your Sabbath. This particular festival has specific requirements in the Old Testament. There were specific requirements for both a priest and for the people. I love the analogy, and you're going to see some how they transfer over to our beliefs as God has ordained them in the New Testament as well. But in the Old Testament, the first thing the Jewish people had to learn about Yom Kippur was this. <laughs> On that day, they were allowed to do nothing. It was a Sabbath of rest. Did you hear that? If any man did any work, they were to be destroyed from among the people. And in verse 28 of Leviticus 23, it tells you the reason why you're not allowed to do any work on that day. Verse 28 says, you will do no work in that same day for, there's your for or because, if you will, because it's a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. So the first thing you have to learn is if you want to get your sin covered over, you're not allowed to do any work about it. Gee, is there any New Testament correlation to that? How about Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, right? And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of what? Works, lest any man should boast or brag. So it is even the pattern in the Old Testament. The Jewish people were not allowed to do anything at all if they wanted to get their sin covered over. As a matter of fact, they can't do anything as well because it's a day for somebody else to do the work on their behalf. The ordinance requirements in that day was this. The one and only man among all the men of Israel, able to make an atonement for the people was a priest. 
Only a priest anointed to make the atonement was even permitted inside the tabernacle on the day of the congregation on Yom Kippur until he comes in and comes out again. The one and only priest above all the Levite priests that they had was the high priest. And the high priest had to be either Aaron or one of his sons. And what he did is he made an atonement for the sanctuary, the whole list, the tabernacle, the altar, the priest, and all the congregation of the people. And the one and only place that the high priest could make an atonement was within the Holy of Holies, within the holy place. And Leviticus 16.3 even says, Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place. And the one and only day of the year, the high priest was even permitted within the veil in the holy place, was on Yom Kippur. Under penalty of death, for the Lord would appear in the cloud upon the most mercy seat. And I love this phrase that God told Moses, and that's where I will meet with you, at the mercy seat. And the priest on this particular day is going to have to wear a separate set of garments. What I'm wearing is his normal attire. Now, can you? Is this mic not picking me up? <coughs> okay, then I'll stay here. <laughs> I can also show you. There's the high priest as well, wearing his normal attire. This is what he wore every day when he woke up in the morning. It starts out with a linen garment underneath. And above that is a blue robe, and at the base of the robe are bells. As a matter of fact, the Lord told him to put a golden bell and a cloth pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate, all the way around the base of that garment. Josephus, a Jewish historian, tells us that there was 200 of them in the base of that garment. 200 bells. One of the things about your high priest, that if you're only reading it in the text that you're going to miss, is that you know, one thing for sure is... He's going to be very easy to find. No matter where he walks, he's going to be ringing bells. Correct? So you know where your high priest is at all times. Interesting thing about that is this. We're also told in the New Testament, we likewise are believer priests, right? Offering up the sacrifices of praise continually. Even the fruit of our lips. Singing praise and melody in our hearts to the Lord. The interesting thing is that means that everywhere the high priest went, you heard bells ringing. And when you hear bells ringing, is that a sad sound? No, it's a, a happy occasion. I, I, Pastor Jace, this will preach. You ready? That means that every step the high priest took in his service to the Lord was a step of joy. It's a joy to serve the Lord, isn't it? And since they put pomegranates there, I guess that's where the fruit is too. The fruit of the Lord, if you will, as a result of serving the Lord, it's a, a step of joy. Above that, he wears an ephod, kind of like a poncho, completely woven without. No seam, no zipper, no buttons or anything. It just threw over top of it. And it, above that would be a breastplate. And that breastplate had 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel so that he was always representing Israel wherever he went. And then above that, that breastplate was clasped on with a golden chain to two onyx stones on his shoulders. And above, he wears a mitre with a blue ribbon across the top, a white mitre. And in the middle of it is a golden plate that says in Hebrew, Chodesh la Yehovah, holy to the Lord. In other words, this man is special. He's separate and sanctified and set apart for the Lord. And he indeed will do the work on your behalf on Yom Kippur. So in effect, if you don't mind me suggesting this, I guess if you're not allowed to do any work and you're Israel, the only person who's allowed to do the work on your behalf is the high priest. So if you're going to get your sin covered over, you're going to have to just trust in the successful work of your high priest. Is there any connection? Okay. The, uh, the irony is the word for this festival is called Yom Kippur, and it's unfortunately translated a day of atonement, which indeed it was not. Yom Kippur, the word Kippur simply means to cover. As a matter of fact, the Jewish men, the yarmulke they wear, sometimes a shortened word for that is, it's a kipper. <laughs> that means it's a covering, a head covering. And in reality, the Old Testament sacrifices never did what Jesus did. It never atoned for sin. It never removed the power of sin. 
All it did was cover it over. As a matter of fact, once a year on Yom Kippur, I'll step back so I don't break Adam's ears anymore. <laughs> once a year on Yom Kippur, uh, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest is only covering the sin over for one more year. But the power of sin is still there. It doesn't remove sin. In other words, what was going on in the Old Testament, and they had to do the sacrifices, or God would have brought judgment upon the nation, all God was doing once a year on Yom Kippur was going like this. For another year. And then they put the blood on this mercy seat again, and he once again covers his eyes. Every sin in the Old Testament is never covered by the blood of bulls and goats. Isn't that what Hebrew says? For by the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. You see, but it was teaching a principle that was coming in the New Testament. It required the death of an innocent victim for the guilty party. And blood had to be sprinkled. But all the Old Testament saint sins, from the Adam all the way up until, if you will, John the Baptist, all the sins of the Old Testament are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because he offers himself through an eternal spirit because he was God in the flesh. Therefore, he covers all men's sin for all time. Even the ones you haven't committed. How powerful is that? On Yom Kippur, the high priest gets up in the morning. Just so we know, he dresses in this attire. And so, if you will, there's the tabernacle. And that's what it looks like on a daily basis. You can see the tabernacle's pattern there, if you will. One of the things I like about it when you look at it is, you know, God's presence is inside the building. And if you want to go close to God, there's only one way. The tabernacle didn't have many doors, did it? Just one. And Jesus is the only way too, isn't he? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And interestingly enough, if you look in the outer court, that's activity on a daily basis when they're bringing their sacrifices, if you will. That's the tabernacle, what it looks like on Yom Kippur, because nobody else is allowed inside there except the high priest. Let's go back again. There's the tabernacle, and in the outer court, the first thing you bump into is the brazen altar. That's the altar of sacrifice. So interestingly enough, if you want to get closer to God, the first thing you've got to deal with is the sin question. You have to bump, you bump right into the altar of sacrifice. But as I said, this is what it looked like on a daily basis as they traveled in the wilderness. But on Yom Kippur, it looks like that. Now, at the risk, Pastor Herb, of getting stoned, I'm about to share with you what I call, not, instead of an urban myth, a wilderness myth. How many of you have heard that in addition to this attire, that on Yom Kippur, when the high priest went behind the veil, he had a rope tied around either his foot or his waist? How many beside me? You've heard the story, right? All I'm going to tell you is that I've looked in every Jewish resource, and that story is nowhere to be found. That is not true. It is a myth. So I'm going to... <laughs> All right, no stones so far. And I have very good reason to tell you why. The story goes is that there would be a guy on the opposite side of the veil, right, holding onto the rope so that in case the high priest died, what, they would pull him out. And uh, so th th here's, the, here's the problem. First and foremost, if I think that if anybody put on a rope around their foot or around their waist, God would strike them dead because that was not part of the attire that he ordained. What a lack of faith that would be. We have no record, by the way, of any, any high priest ever dying on Yom Kippur. But more importantly, turn back to Leviticus 16. This is why the tabernacle looks like this on Yom Kippur. Verse 17, Leviticus 16, 17, tells me that there was nobody inside the building holding onto a rope. There will be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goes in to make an atonement in the holy place until he comes out and has made an atonement for himself, for his household, and all the congregation of Israel. How many people are allowed inside the tabernacle complex? Just one, the high priest. Anybody else allowed? No. So if there was somebody there holding on to a rope, God would strike them both dead because they're only allowed to have one man. And I think this is a better reason why. You see, only one man is allowed to do the work on your behalf. And it's your high priest. 
So it is today. Only one man does the work for you. So I'm sorry, the myth is, uh, wait, oh, wait a minute. Somebody once told me, he said, well, wait a minute. What if he did have the rope? And it was just a really long rope. And nobody was in the building. And it came all the way outside the doorway. Can you imagine that? And then the guy dies, and then they're going to pull the rope, right? Oh, no, I think his legs are stuck on the altar of incense. <laughs> Look. There's no problem. If a high priest even died from a heart attack or whatever behind the veil on that particular day, probably because he was scared for all that what was going on that day, that would be no problem. All God would have to do, you wouldn't need a rope to pull him out. God would come up out of the building. How did you know where the where, when God was in the tabernacle building? It was a cloud of smoke by day, remember, and a pillar of fire by night. Do you know how they traveled in the wilderness? How did they know when it was time to pack up and go and stop and put it back up again? God would come up out of the building and hover it over it. Once he's outside the building, you could go in and take all the furniture, take everything, pack up, and then they would follow the, the Shekinah glory, the presence of God. And when God stopped and hovered over a place, okay, that's where he wants us to set back up again. You'd set the tabernacle back up again. And when God went inside the building, you're not allowed behind the veil except once a year on Yom Kippur. So there's no problem. And by the way, Moses did not lead the children of Israel uh, through the wilderness. God did. Moses was a good minister, though. He followed the Lord. That'll preach too, Pastor. I know you. He followed the Lord, and the Lord told them where to stop, and the Lord led them through the wilderness. But this is what it looks like on Yom Kippur. This is the tabernacle area. As I said, the first thing in the outer court is the brazen altar, the place where they brought sacrifices to cover over their sins. And then the laver in the background would be for, obviously, it gets a little messy when you're killing animals. And behind that is the floor pan of everything. If you look, there's, you only count six pieces, but I believe there's seven pieces of furniture in the tabernacle. In the outer court is the brazen altar and the laver that I just showed you. But then you go in the building, and in the front part, the holy place, there's three pieces of furniture. Um, and that, the high priest had a job on a daily basis with his attire on. He had to light the lampstand. There was a table of showbread. And there was an altar of incense. The high priest's job was to light the lampstand and trim it each day and take care of the altar of incense. There's the lampstand. As you walked into the building, it would be on your left-hand side. And then on the opposite would be the table of showbread where the 12 loaves are there representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And right before you go behind the veil into the Holy of Holies is the altar of incense with an incense so sweet that um, no one else was allowed to use it except the priest. And that's another thing that we can't read from the text and get a, an appreciation of. Not only did you know where your high priest was by the bells as he's walking, he's around that altar of incense all the time. And this is a material much like a carpet. You ever go into a motel and you knew that the people before you were smoking because the smoke stays with the carpet? This has the opposite effect. It's a very sweet aroma. And when your high priest was walking around, every time he passed, it would give you a sweet aroma as well. Interesting, isn't it? Serving the Lord is indeed a smelling savor. Adam's going to shoot me before the service is over. <laughs> He's picking up the stone now. All right. Behind the altar of incense is the veil. It was one piece of cloth, knitly woven throughout. There was no seam in it whatsoever. The only thing in it was woven into it, the cherubims of glory. It was made out of scarlet and white and blue and gold, interwoven in such a way that it was one piece of cloth about this thick. It wasn't a little tiny carpet, a throw rug. It was huge and very heavy. And behind the veil, so we have five pieces so far, the two in the outer court, brazen altar, the laver, golden lampstand, table of showbread, and the altar of incense. That's five. But then behind the veil are really two pieces. The bottom part is called the Ark of the Covenant. And it was made of acacia wood covered with gold. And inside it had three pieces. What was it? Who remembers? The Ten Commandments, Adam's rod that budded, and a bowl of manna. They were inside the Ark of the Covenant. And then above that was a mercy seat, and it was of a different construction. The lid of the Ark was made entirely of gold. It was a miracle of God how it was made. According to the text, the, the lampstand and the, and the, and the, and the um, mercy seat were hammered out. 
with one piece of gold. Can you imagine trying to find one piece of gold to do that and hammer that out? It was by a miracle of God. And in between the cherubim of glory that have their wings on high, God was hovering over the mercy seat. And that's where he said to Moses, that's where I'll meet with you. You know what I like about that? The law is down in the bottom of the cabinet, isn't it? And the mercy seat's on top. Because God values mercy higher than he does law. And though, so there you have your, your you will, your, your tabernacle on a daily basis, and that's what he did. He got up and he did all those things. But on Yom Kippur, it's different. On that day when he, he, he gets ready, the night before, and if you look in Leviticus 16, he's not going to wear this attire on Yom Kippur, except when he first gets up. What he'll do is when he first gets up in the morning, he's going to put on all this clothing as he normally would, and then... After he goes inside the tabernacle building, what's going to be prepared for them is a separate set of clothes that he uses on Yom Kippur. Not this. It's going to be all white. Leviticus 16. Thus shall, verse 3, Leviticus 16, 3. Thus will Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He'll put on the holy linen cloak. He'll have linen breeches upon his flesh. He'll be girded with a linen girdle and with a linen mitre will be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore, he will wash his flesh in water and so put them on. What he does the night before, he puts a set of separate linen garments inside the tabernacle building. He gets up in the morning and puts all this on, goes into the building, removes all this, and puts on all white. Which means for a period of time, he's doing work, and you won't hear any bells. Because that's one of the things, that, one of the myths also that was with that story about him having a rope. That when he's behind the veil, he'll keep ringing his bells so you knew he was alive. Well, the problem is, he didn't ring bells when he was back there anyway. Because he had a separate set of linen clothes, all white. And for a period of time, you don't know where your high priest is, and you don't know whether he is alive or dead. On this day, he takes those linen clothes, and the first thing he has to do is present a sacrifice for himself and his house. And what that is, is a young bull. Look in Leviticus 16.6. 6. Aaron will offer his bullock for a sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. Jump down to verse 11. And Aaron will bring the bullock for the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself for his house, and kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and he will do something else. Do you notice what's in the high priest's left hand on the picture above? That's called a censer. And what it is is a portable version of the altar of incense. Here's the problem. God's dwelling behind the veil. He's hovering above the mercy seat. And didn't God tell Moses, no man can look upon me and live? Correct? As a matter of fact, when Moses asked, he wanted to look at God face to face. He told him, no, nobody can do that and live. So he put him in a crack of a rock and he passed by, covered the rock. And as he passed by, he removed his hand and Moses saw God as he moved away from his hindquarters. But even that little bit of a glimpse of the Lord, when Moses came back down from the mountain, his face was all aglow, so much so that he had to put a veil in front of it because they couldn't look at Moses. Here's another one. Ready, Pastor Erd? What's that teaching you? If you get too close to God, he's liable to rub off on you too. <laughs> right? The glory of the Lord was rubbing off on Moses' face. But we take the presence of God for granted. If you really want to know if God's always hidden his power or his glory, for in the Old Testament, in a tabernacle, in the body of Jesus. And even Jesus, when he appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration, showed what his glorified body will be in the, in, if, if you will, during the Millennial Kingdom, which is pictured in the Feast of Tabernacles. I'll have to come back sometime in the future and we'll do that one. But uh, if you really want to know what God's face is like, just go to the book of Revelation chapter 20. When John sees a man sit on the great white throne, and he says, from him whose face the heavens and the earth passed away, and there was no place found for them. Someday the face of the Lord will melt the time-space universe. So how valuable is this building going to be that day? Or that car that you've been holding on to? Oh, I'm looking, I'm going to preach it now. All right, let's move on. Some, the only thing that will pass by the face of the Lord at the great white throne are the souls of men. 
They last forever. So let's put our time in where moth and rust doesn't corrupt. There, I finished my preaching, okay? So I just close in prayer now? Nah, let's finish the message. All right. So if that's what the presence of God is, if you're in the presence of God, you're going to melt. That's the problem. Moses has to take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it on the mercy seat with his finger seven times on the east side in front of the mercy seat. How's he going to do that and not get melted? Here's how. You see that censer? Look what it says in Leviticus 16, 12. He will take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small and bring them within the veil. And he'll put the incense upon the fire before the Lord so that the cloud of the incense uh, may cover the mercy seat that's upon the testimony. And what's the last clause say? That he what? That he doesn't die. So guess what? He's supposed to cloud up the room with the incense so God's glory doesn't melt him. And he has to do that behind the veil. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm wearing a high priest robe, so I can identify with what he had to do on that day. He had to go behind the veil. We don't know how. Did he go under it? That seems to be a little awkward because he's got a burning coals of fire and incense in his hands as well. And a, a basin of blood from the, for the, for the, from the bullock that he, was, that he already killed. What he had to do is probably go around the side and lean on the side of the tent and go around the veil, if you will. And if I'm going in and I know that the reason what I'm doing is to keep me alive, I'm going in backwards. I'm not facing that mercy seat until after I know that that room is clouded up. So I'll put the incense on with my back to the mercy seat and I'm staying back there at least 45 minutes, <laughs> maybe an hour. That room's going to be plenty smoky before I turn my face toward the mercy seat. So the room gets clouded up and then he takes the blood. It says in verse 14, he will take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward and before in front of the mercy seat, he will sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. So that's what he does to cover the sins of his house and himself. Then the high priest, after he's finished that, he will come back out. He'll walk all the way out to the beginning of the tabernacle building, right at the doorway, where we'll be waiting for him because they know they're supposed to do that. They'll have two goats waiting there. Those goats are going to be the goats that cover the nation's sins. The first goat, by tradition, he would stand there. And the goat that would come up in his right hand, that one gets killed. It's for Jehovah, and he has to repeat the same process and take the blood of the goat, sprinkle it on the mercy seat to cover the people's sins. Then he has to come walking all the way back out, goes to the doorway of the tabernacle once again, and the goat that remains, he puts his two hands over that goat, and he confesses all the sins of the people. In other words, that goat is going to get blamed for all the people's sins. Thus, we got that term, what? Scapegoat, because the goat's getting blamed for the people's sins. Once again, and that goat is carried off into the wilderness where it's not allowed to return to the camp. That camp of that goat, although it's alive, will eventually die, it won't survive in the desert, but it's not allowed to return into the camp again. And the two parts of that, I think, are teaching really the ministry of our Savior. It requires the death of an innocent victim for the guilty party. The blood is necessary for the covering of the sin. That's the dead goat. But the live goat gets, takes the sin out of the camp and is not allowed to return. Because as far as the east is from the west, doesn't the Lord remove our sin from us? It's no longer applied to you or to the camp. After that's finished, after he go, goes through all that process, then he has to complete a few other things to finish the day. He, he, he will wash himself in water. And I, I will say this, there's one more tradition that I need to share with you that I think is very important about that scapegoat. I'm going to make this very clear, especially if this is recorded, I will make, make sure you hear this. You do not have to believe this tradition that I'm about to tell you. Did you hear what I said? You do not have to believe this because this is not in the scripture. But the Jewish people have a tradition that what used to take place on Yom Kippur was the following. In addition to the goat would come up in the right hand, that by tradition would be the one that he would kill. The live goat that was sent off into the wilderness, they used to tie a scarlet colored ribbon around its neck. 
And when it got off into the, out of the camp, God would miraculously turn the ribbon white. You don't have to believe this, but Isaiah 118, though our sins be as scarlet, they'll be made as what? White as snow. So, you don't have to believe it. I happen to believe the tradition is true. The reason being because in the Jewish commentary called the Babylonian Talmud, they talk about what went on at the temple during the 40 years before the temple was destroyed. Our rabbis taught, and this is in the Babylonian Talmud, Yoma 39 A and B, during the last 40 years before the destruction of Jerusalem, the lot for the Lord wouldn't come up in the right hand, nor did the crimson colored strap become white. What they're saying is, the strap that was on the live goat they sent off in the wilderness, God would no longer turn it white during the 40 years before the temple was destroyed. When was the temple destroyed? Anyone? 70 AD. Did anything significant happen about 40 years before that? How about Jesus Christ offered himself once for all on the cross of Calvary and the veil in the temple, what happened? Was rent from top to bottom, saying that access to me was no longer going to be by this method, but it's by a new and a living method. You don't have to believe the tradition. I happen to believe it. Because what that's saying is, after Christ died, if during the last 40 years before the temple was destroyed, God would no longer turn the crimson colored strap white because he wasn't acknowledging this method of sacrifice any longer. And if the Jewish people knew what that suggested, they would have removed it in the Talmud long ago. I happen to believe that indeed, Christ's sacrifice was the finished product, if you will, of the resurrection and the greatest sacrifice of all. When the high priest's work was complete, he would return inside the tabernacle. He took off the holy linen garments and he would leave them in a separate place by themselves and then come out. Every time I read that in the Old Testament, I think of what happened when Peter and John ran to the tomb and they found that Jesus had risen from the dead and they found the linen garments laid in a laid by themselves because the, fi the finished product of our sacrifice was done. And by the way, I don't know if you knew it or not, do you know what that also proves that the Romans that tried to lie about it were wrong? Because they tried to say that, they just tell everybody that the disciples stole his body. If, if, they would, if, if someone was gonna steal the body, would they bother to unwrap it first? You see, he un his, his clothes were unwrapped and slept in a separate place. Well, in the Old Testament, then the high priest would come forth and offer a ram for a burnt offering. He offered the fat of the sin offerings. Uh, the, the carcasses of the bull and the goat that were killed were carried outside the camp and burned on an altar of wood. And that's what even Hebrews tells us in chapter 13. Let us come outside the camp, uh, bearing his reproach. Outside the camp, if Jesus did not die within the walls of, of Jerusalem, I think by being crucified outside the walls. He was signifying he wasn't just dying for the Jewish people, he was dying for the sins of the whole world outside the camp. And then finally that, we have the, the completion of that, he would have his own clothes, he would go back inside the building and he would put his own clothes on once again. The interesting thing is about Yom Kippur is that the modern day Jewish observance is incorrect. God told them, the life of the flesh is in the blood. I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. You know what the Jewish people do now on Yom Kippur to sacrifice? They don't eat. God never ordained that they shouldn't eat on Yom Kippur. That was a rabbinic adjustment after they couldn't bring a blood sacrifice anymore. In the Old Testament, it's interesting if you look in numbers and the pattern of those sacrifices. If you sinned and you were near the temple once a day, you could bring an offering of maybe a turtle dove or, an, or a flower, even for the poor, because something yielded its life on your behalf. Once a week, the head of the household would bring an offering up to Jerusalem, like the house of David, whoever the head of the house would, they would bring an offering. Once a month, the head of the tribe would bring a sacrifice up to the temple to, come, to be a, a, a picture of, of the gift coming from the tribe. And then once a year, on Yom Kippur, the high priest alone would offer a sacrifice that would cover over the nation's sins. 
fascinating. What I noticed by that is the more people that get covered, the less frequently the sacrifice is offered. Once a day for a person, once a week a house, once a month a tribe, and once a year for the people. Now what one sacrifice could God add to that that would also allow Gentiles to get covered? And how often would that have to be offered? How about Jesus Christ's sacrifice, once for all, for all mankind? And how often would it have to be repeated? Never again. How many people get covered? All men sin for all time. And the sacrifice uh, got more expensive. The, the sacrificial victim always was more expensive uh, the less frequently it was offered. And of course, what is the greatest sacrifice God have could have provided was the death of his only son. The significance of this whole scenario, if you will, is this. There is a first coming significance because Christ becomes a better high priest for us than those of the Old Testament, doesn't he? According to Hebrews, he's a better high priest of a different order. He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek was paid tithes to by Abraham. Well, Abraham is the father of Isaac, who's the father of Jacob, who's the father of Levi, the priests. So when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, so was Levi. The lesser priesthood was paying tithes to the greater priesthood. According to the Old Testament, you could not be a king and a priest at the same time. To be a king, you had to be from Judah. To be a priest, you had to be from Levi, where Melchizedek was both a king and a priest at the same time. And whereas those priests that wore this uniform all the time, I don't know if you heard it or not, they were not allowed to continue by reason of death. All the guys that wore this uniform all died. Whereas Christ is, serves with the power of an endless life when it says in Psalm 110, Thou art a priest, how long? Forever after the design of Melchizedek. He's a better high priest because he serves in a better sanctuary. The true one, the one that's in heaven, not in one made on earth. He's a better high priest because he mediates a better covenant established upon better promises, the new covenant, which remembers sin no more. The interesting thing is, did you see all that furniture I showed you in the tabernacle? Did you notice something was missing? There's no chair. Why? Because their work was never done. It only covered their sin over for another year. Whereas after Christ offered himself a sacrifice, he ascended into heaven and did what? sat down at the right hand of his father saying it's all finished only thing waiting now is till his enemies become his footstool he's a better high priest because the victim's blood was a much better quality i will tell you this this new covenant is a very important one we're covered by it as gentiles I, you see oops i slipped i told you i was gentile i, I usually like to tell you that later when you get real disappointed <laughs> You assume I'm in Jewish missions, I also have to be Jewish by birth, right? And so what happens, this always happens, how did your family react when you stop going to synagogue? And I tell them I'm Jewish, and then all the believers go, oh. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I couldn't help it. <laughs> Nevertheless, Romans 11 tells us that through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. And you got to admit, I am the most Gentile-looking high priest you'll ever see with glasses and no beard. All right. The new covenant is a promise to made to Israel. The new covenant says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. That's how I knew. Not according to the covenant that I made with them when I took them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they broke, even though I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this is the covenant I'll make with them after those days. I will write my law in their inward parts and in their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. They will no longer say, every man to his neighbor, know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, their sin and iniquity I will forgive and I will remember their sin no more. Now where remission of that is, there's no more sacrifice. So the sacrifice of Jesus covers all men's sin for all time, but it's also the promise of the new covenant. And Yom Kippur also has a second coming significance. I said Rosh Hashanah is a picture of the rapture of the church. Did you hear that word afflicted? After the sound of the trumpet, someday in the future there's going to be a great time of affliction. Pastor, if you're thinking that I'm suggesting in any way that the sound of the trumpet precedes the tribulation just because of this metaphor, you are absolutely correct. 
I do believe that the trumpet precedes the time of affliction, concluding with a day just like in the Old Testament when all Israel would get their sin covered over. And someday in the future, at the end of the tribulation, according to Zechariah 13, 8, 9, after two-thirds of the Israeli population is cut off and dies, it says, I'll bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined and as gold is tested. I will be their God. They will be my people. They will say, the Lord is my God. I will say it is my people. They will say, the Lord is my God. And Romans 11, 25, 26, all Israel that's alive at the second coming of Jesus Christ will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Well, the only thing that remains to conclude this presentation is this. One final tradition. And Pastor, after I sound the shofar, you can come up and conclude. But, just so you know, that at the end of the Day of Atonement, when the high priest returns and he moves all the weight, puts on his garb again, and he starts walking out of the tabernacle building, what would you start to hear? You would hear the bells when he's all finished, done, and offering all the sacrifices. You hear the bells. By tradition, what the Jewish people would do is someone would sound the great sound of the shofar to let everybody know that the, the sacrifice was finished. And so you would hear something like this. I hope I have the lip here. After all that talking. <laughs> accepted their sacrifice and secondly because they knew that their high priest lives and so is yours so keep sounding that joy thank you thank you Tom Sharon nobody learned a thing here today right <laughs> okay that was good stuff that's wonderful, and I know that they'll be available afterwards to talk to you, answer any questions and things. Just uh, These are the kind of missionaries that we're supporting and working with, and, and they have that ministry in Philadelphia. And so we just uh, thank God uh, that they've been coming. I think you have one more thing to do, don't you? Yes, sir. Okay, we'll come and do it. Okay. Would everyone please rise? On Yom Kippur, it was tra by tradition, it was the only time that the high priest would do this. But he would give the ironic benediction. I'll give you the one that we do in Philadelphia for our Jewish people every Friday night with a little bit of a twist to it because of Jesus. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee, be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. In Yeshua, the Messiah, our Lord and our King. Amen. Shalom Aleichem. Yeah.